Hey guys, quickly before the video begins, I just want to thank all of you for the support. Um, I am finally freed up to start doing some more stuff, so expect to hear from me more often. And I also need to give a shout out. I have two new patrons on uh, patreon.com, and I need to give a shout out to Fallout Shy and Kim Air. Thank you guys so much for the support. It means the world to me. And if you do enjoy the video, please make sure to give it a like. Thank you guys again. This story is probably a bit different than your average real-life horror story, but it sends chills down my spine every time I think about it. In the summer of 2011, I was living in southern Ohio. I moved to the area for school, but eventually lost interest in it and subsequently dropped out. I had attained a pretty decent job after dropping out of school, but after getting into an altercation with the owner of the business, I was let go from the job. I began looking around for any job I could find. I ended up having a bit of difficulty finding anywhere hiring when I was going around to local places near me and putting in applications. Eventually, I turned to Craigslist to see if I could have any better luck there. I ended up submitting my resume to a handful of listings and eventually came across an ad that looked pretty interesting. Basically, the individual was looking for someone that would take care of their land for them the pay was good enough for what I needed at the time, and I thought the job sounded pretty fun. I gave the man a call about the job and asked him if it was still available. He told me it was still available and asked me if I wanted to come out and see what the job entailed. He also said that if I agreed to the job and was able to do the things he needed me to do, that the job was mine. I was pretty excited since I had such bad luck up to this point. He and I set up a time to meet the following day. It wasn't super close to where I lived, but it also wasn't too far to commute back and forth. I got ready to meet the man the next day and left my place a bit early so I would make it on time. The majority of the drive there went completely fine. I found myself getting close to the location I was meeting the man at. Once I was less than 10 minutes away, I was completely caught off guard and blindsided by something hitting into the side of my car. At first, I believed a deer had run into my car. I hit the brakes and came to a stop. Before I was even able to get out of the car and check on the animal and review the damage, I saw a man get up and begin to run away. He looked to be between 50 and 60 years old and he was completely nude from head to toe. I was driving around 20 to 25 miles an hour when the man ran into my car. He didn't appear to be severely hurt since he was able to get up so quickly and resume running around. Once I was out of my car and was watching the man run off, I noticed a couple police cars that were following the man. One of the police cars caught up to the man who was running down the road and cut him off. The police were able to apprehend him at that point. Another police car pulled up behind me and the officer approached me. He asked me if I was okay and I told him that I was. The officer and I looked at my car and there didn't appear to be any damage. The officer then told me that I would need to make a statement in regards to the accident. I told him I was on my way to a job interview, and he told me that since I was involved in the accident, that I couldn't leave the scene until he took a statement from me. The officer was mindful of my situation and appeared to try to hurry when it came to taking down my statement, but even though he did this, there were still a lot of details he needed to get, and it took quite a while. By the time I was cleared to leave, I knew that I was going to be late to my interview. I ended up basically assuming that since I didn't get to the interview on time and didn't call the guy about being late, that I obviously wasn't going to get hired. So like a coward, I just drove home and didn't even try to contact the guy. I never heard from him again and never tried to contact him. A few weeks later, I saw a news report about two gentlemen using a Craigslist ad to lure individuals to their location so they could murder them. They posted an ad about a job that didn't exist and when someone would show up to try to get the job, they would be killed. The location the news reported that this happened at was the same location I was supposed to go to that day. Their scheme was revealed when one of the individuals were shot, but managed to escape with their lives and reported to the police what was going on. The mastermind behind this was 52-year-old Richard Beasley. He also used a 16-year-old named Brogan Rafferty to help him carry out these murders. I felt so unlucky when I first got into that accident and missed out on what I thought was going to be an awesome job. But now, 
I am so grateful that the mentally insane man ran into the side of my car that day. If he hadn't, I seriously doubt I would be able to write this right now. But the story doesn't end there. A couple months after all of this, I shamefully ended up moving back to my parents' house in my hometown of Stowe, Ohio. I moved in there with plans of only living there for a couple months while I saved up some money. I ended up getting a job at a small pizza shop as a delivery driver. One day, someone had called in an order to be delivered. While my manager was getting the food made, he mentioned to me that I would be delivering food to the mother of one of the Craigslist killers. I inquired him for more information, and he told me that Brogan Rafferty's mother ordered from us all the time. I told him about what had happened to me, and how I almost fell victim to them myself. My manager was shocked when he heard my story, and told me if I wasn't comfortable going to that woman's house, I didn't have to. I told him it was okay, I didn't mind going there to deliver food. Both men involved in the killings had already been in jail for a while at this point. It's not like I would be in any danger or anything. When I got to the woman's house, I delivered her food. I didn't plan on saying anything to her, but found myself telling her how sorry I was for what she had to go through, and that I knew her son was not a bad person, and he was just forced into doing something wrong by a man he deeply admired and looked up to. I also told her about my close call in regards to what those guys were doing. We ended up talking for a while. She told me I was a miracle and she was so glad I never made it there that day. I saw her quite a few more times since then, when she would either come in to pick up food or when I delivered it to her. This was several years ago now and I hope she's still doing okay. But let this be a lesson to anyone that hears this story. When something sounds too good to be, then it's probably not real. And never, ever, run blindly into a situation you're not familiar with. I'm a 20 year old girl and this story took place a year ago when I was 19. After I graduated high school, I decided to take a year off from school before going to college. So instead of going to school, I decided to find a full-time job. Eventually, I had saved up a considerable amount of money and decided that I wanted to move out of my parents' house and get my own place. I began looking on Craigslist for a place that fit the description of what I was looking for. I wanted a place that was at least pretty nice and something that wasn't too far from my job or parents' house. I ended up looking at a couple places, but they ended up having more space than I needed and cost more than what I wanted to pay. But then one day, I came across another ad on Craigslist that looked perfect. The ad was actually several months old, but had just been updated the same day I found it. The location was good, and the pictures of the place looked really nice. And even better, it was within my price range. I replied to the ad by sending a text message to the number that was posted along with the ad. Only about a minute later, I received a phone call from that number. The landlord that called me sounded like a very nice guy, and I told him that I was interested in taking a look at the place. He told me I could come anytime, and that he was even available that very evening. I didn't want to miss this opportunity, so I agreed to meet him that night. He sent me the address, and I made myself look as presentable as possible. A bit later, I showed up to the address that he sent me. It was a nice looking duplex. I could tell by looking at it that someone was putting care into maintaining the place. Once I was in the driveway, the landlord met me outside and introduced himself. His name was Bruce, and he looked like any typical middle-aged man. He told me that the tenant prior to me was a great tenant but they ended up having to move to a different part of the country for work. After that, I found out that he actually lived in the other side of the duplex and therefore maintains the units and property himself. Bruce was a very nice, decent looking man. He made me feel comfortable as he showed me around the duplex. The place looked perfect. It was very nice inside and looked just like the pictures on Craigslist. The downstairs had a nice living room, a kitchen, a dining area, and a half bathroom. Upstairs, there was a large bedroom, a smaller bedroom I could use for storage, and a full bathroom. I was in love with the place, and the price was way more affordable than I would ever imagine for a place like this. At the end of the tour, I didn't waste any time, and I told him I would take it. I moved in about 10 days later, once the first of the month had arrived. I had a few friends help me move everything, but like usual, it was a ton of work. I spent all night getting everything set up the way I wanted it and finally, I was able to relax. 
I remember having such an intense feeling of peace come over me once I had everything arranged and was just able to enjoy my surroundings. The morning after moving in, Bruce came over and knocked on my door. He said he just wanted to check in and make sure everything was good with the apartment. I told him it was great and he said if I ever needed anything to just stop by or give him a call. For the next couple months, I just went on with my life as normal. I continued working, spending a little time with friends, and often just relaxing at home reading or watching movies. I would see Bruce every once in a while when I would pay rent and occasionally when we ran into each other outside when we were coming and going. Every time I interacted with him, he was as nice and friendly as ever. I never got any type of weird or creepy vibes from him at all, but this all eventually changed. One night, I was sitting at home just browsing through Facebook and I got a message from my friend Greg. I would known Greg for more than half of my life and he was a very good friend of mine and someone I could really trust. His message just said, we really need to talk, let me know when you get this. I messaged him back right away and asked him what was up. He told me he needed to show me something that he found and before I knew it, I was staring at pictures of myself. Most of them showed me either in my underwear or completely nude. What was even worse was that all these images of me were taken while I was in my apartment. Some of them were of me in my bathroom, some were taken in my bedroom, and there were even pictures of me in my living room. Sometimes I would walk around in my underwear or nude while I'm home alone. My curtains and blinds make it impossible for anyone to see in and I feel comfortable that way. I was absolutely shocked and horrified at what I was seeing. Greg asked me if I knew about these images, and I told him of course I didn't. He told me there were also videos of me too, and he sent some over to me. I was so embarrassed and so angry that this was happening. I asked Greg where he got the pictures from, and he sent me the link to the website. It was some type of ex-girlfriend revenge site. I found a way to message the administrator of the website and explain that these particular pictures were of me, and I demanded that they remove them. I told them they were taken without my knowledge and a crime was committed by someone doing this to me. Greg and I talked more about the situation, and after discussing all of the details, we came to the conclusion that there must be cameras hidden around my apartment. I began searching all over and used the pictures as a reference for where the cameras must have been, and when I checked each spot, I found the same small hole in the wall each time. I couldn't believe that Bruce had done this to me, I, I still can't and I assume that's why he let me have this place for so cheap. Greg ended up coming over to inspect the holes himself, and he confirmed that he saw cameras in there. He brought a flashlight with him and was able to get a reflection when he shined the light into each hole. We immediately put duct tape over every hole we could find that night. After that, Greg invited me to spend the night at his place and then go to the police in the morning to file a report. I happily took him up on the offer. The next morning, I filed the report and later in the day, a couple police officers came to my apartment to inspect the place. Unfortunately, Bruce must have seen me discover the cameras or notice I had covered all of them up because the next day when the police came looking for them, they were gone. And without the cameras being up still, the police said they really couldn't do anything. Luckily, the website my photos were on did take them down after I messaged them. I don't know if Bruce still has them or deleted them out of fear of getting in trouble but I hope they don't end up online again. I had a signed one year lease when I moved into this place, but I didn't care. I obviously couldn't stay there anymore. I sent Bruce a text telling him I couldn't stay here anymore and would be moving out in a couple days. All he sent back was okay. He obviously knew he was busted because I moved out and he never said anything about the lease. In fact, I literally never heard from him again and that's fine with me. I am a lot more mindful of my surroundings these days. I never want to feel that type of hopelessness or fear ever again. So, I've never been particularly good when it comes to interacting with girls. I'm not a bad looking guy or anything, but I just always feel incredibly awkward meeting girls and trying to talk to them. Therefore, I've spent most of my life single. I've dated a couple girls for short periods of time in the past, but it just never really went anywhere. This is probably due to the fact that I was friends with the girls before we started dating. It seems that's the only way I can find a girl. Be friends with her first, and then eventually date for a short period of time. 
So one night, I was sitting around bored by myself like normal. I went on Craigslist to look through the video game section to see if there was anything interesting. I wasn't looking for anything in particular, I was just bored. After finding nothing that piqued my interest, I found myself looking around at the other categories on the main page. That's when I noticed the personal section. Just out of curiosity, I began looking through it. I found a part that said women seeking men, so I clicked on it to see what I could find. There wasn't an overwhelming amount of posts in that section, but I looked through the handful that were there. The majority of the ads that were in this section didn't interest me at all, but as I got towards the bottom of the page, I saw one that stood out. The girl said she was looking for a new guy to spend time with. She was 26 years old, which was only a couple years younger than me, and most importantly, she even had a picture posted with the ad. She looked like a pretty cute girl, so I assumed that a whole slew of guys must have already messaged her at this point, but I figured it wouldn't hurt to try myself. I responded to the ad by sending the girl an email. I just told her I thought she was pretty and told her a little about myself. I then went back to just doing a whole bunch of mindless browsing, looking at things and reading articles that had no real point or value. To my surprise, when I checked my phone, the girl had actually emailed me back. As soon as I saw this, my heart began to race a little bit and I got very excited. I honestly wasn't expecting any type of reply. In her reply, she told me she liked everything I said about myself and asked me if I could send her a picture of myself. I looked through my phone and found the most flattering picture I had of myself and sent it back to her. Maybe five minutes later, she replied again and told me that she thought I was very cute. She also included her phone number in the message and asked me to send her a text. I immediately put her number in my phone and typed out a text message to her. I waited another five minutes to hit send because I didn't want to appear to be too desperate. Once I did send the text, we spent the next two hours texting back and forth. We seemed to be pretty compatible and shared a lot of the same interests. Talking to a girl in this type of way was a lot easier for me, so I was able to express myself way better, and I really began taking a liking to this girl. The conversation was going really well, and then she suddenly suggested that we meet up. I asked her when, and she said, how about now? It felt kind of sudden, but I was excited that she had asked. I really did want to meet her. I told her that I really did want to hang out with her, but I just wanted to speak with her on the phone first, just to make sure I wasn't talking to some strange man posing as a girl. She just sent an LOL back to me, and about a minute later, my phone began to ring. It was from her number. And for some reason, I was very nervous to answer. I did manage to answer the phone though, and to my relief, she did sound exactly like she should have. And when I say that, I mean that she sounded like a girl around the age that she gave me. We talked for a few minutes more, and we made plans for me to come over to her place in about an hour. She texted me her address, and I raced to get ready. I wanted to look my best when I met her for the first time. The name she gave me was Anna. She lived about 20 minutes away. I ended up getting there a little early, so I parked down the street for a few minutes. I wanted to be a minute or two late rather than early. Finally, I arrived at her house. It was a smaller house and it looked a little rough, but she was still pretty young and possibly couldn't afford anything else. I parked my car on the street in front of her house and proceeded to the door. I knocked on her door and waited, but no one came to the door. I knocked again and waited for a while, but still nothing. At this point, I was beginning to feel like some random girl was just playing a prank on me. I grabbed my phone to call her, and right as I was about to, the door finally opened. To my relief, it definitely was the girl in the picture that I saw, but once I stepped inside and got a better look at her, she definitely looked different. She already looked pretty thin in the photo online, but now she looked way thinner, almost deathly skinny. And she was still pretty, but she had these marks on her face. The best way I can describe them is if she had pimples and was constantly picking at them to the point of them turning into these small sores. Like I said, she was still a pretty girl, but she just looked very sickly. We formally introduced ourselves again now that we were in person, and kind of awkwardly talked for about a minute. I began to get this really strange feeling, like she was just giving me a weird vibe but I just figured it was due to being around a girl that I just met and managed to shake it off. But the feeling quickly returned. 
When I entered in the front of the house, we were in the living room. She had invited me over to hang out and watch a movie, and we appeared to be in the room where we would do all of that. But she randomly told me that she had made me a gift and wanted me to come with her so she could show it to me. She was beginning to lead me into another room, and then I heard a loud thud coming from the area we were walking to. I stopped and asked her if there was someone else there. She kind of forced out a small laugh and said no. She told me it must have been one of her cats. I felt hesitant, but really didn't have any definite reason to not trust her. We started walking again, and that's when I heard very faint footsteps. Like someone was almost trying to tiptoe across the floor. I looked at Anna, and she had this expression on her face like she had just been caught doing something wrong. I knew at this point that it was all bad, and while I still had the chance, I booked it for the door. I busted through the front door and sprinted straight to my car. I hopped in and took off down the street as fast as I could until I made it home. She ended up sending me a couple text messages that night, saying things like, Come back, I swear no one else is here, and I worked really hard on your present, please at least come back and get it. I blocked her phone number and haven't heard from her since. Now that I've had some time to think about it, I think I figured out what was going on that night. I believe the picture she posted on her Craigslist ad was an older picture of her. I'm guessing she ended up getting into drugs, which would explain the drastic weight loss and sores on her face. I think that the ad was posted to try to lure someone into her house so she and an accomplice could then rob the person, or maybe even do something worse. I didn't get a look at the person in the other room, but I am 100% positive they were there. This was absolutely the last time I'll ever meet a girl online. This happened to me in the summer of 2014. I am a female in my 20s. I would like to be able to tell my story, but I do not want to give out any specific details, so I'll kind of change some names around. Anyway, my friend and I rented a two-bedroom house. We moved into the house towards the beginning of 2014. Things went well for the first couple months, but then we kept running into problems. Nothing major, we just kept having a lot of petty arguments over dumb things. Basically, we ended up finding out that we weren't very compatible as roommates, so my friend ended up moving out. That left me needing a roommate since I wasn't able to cover all the expenses of the house by myself. I ended up placing an ad on Craigslist since they had a section on there specifically for renting out rooms. I ended up getting a few replies over the next couple days and spoke a bit with each person. I ended up inviting a girl named Becky over to look at the place, as she seemed like the best overall candidate, and told the other people I would let them know if I rent the room out or not. Becky was very close in age to me, and she seemed like a very nice girl. She was also a non-smoker, and said she mostly kept to herself and wouldn't be having a ton of people over or anything like that. She told me she worked full time and went to school part time and was too busy for any type of drama. When she came over to look at the room and the rest of the house, we got to know each other a bit. She seemed absolutely amazing, and I ended up asking her if she wanted to rent the room. She accepted my offer and we were both very happy. I immediately called the other people that had replied and let them know that the room was no longer available. A couple days later, Becky moved her belongings in. At first, it seemed like the more we got to know each other, the better friends we became. But unfortunately, this friendship wouldn't last very long. The first weird thing happened when I tried doing the girl a favor while she was at work. I was getting ready to do laundry and noticed some of her clothes lying around, so I picked them up, washed them, folded them, and left them on her bed. I went to bed not long after. After waking up the following morning, I opened my door and found a piece of paper pinned to the outside of it. I took it off my door and it ended up being a note from Becky. The note said, don't ever touch my clothes again, with the word ever written in all capitals. I was really creeped out by this, but gave Becky the benefit of the doubt and blamed myself for touching her belongings without asking her first. I ended up assuming that for some reason or another, she's very sensitive about people touching her stuff or something. When I saw her later that morning, I apologized for touching her clothes, and she said it was okay, and things quickly went back to normal. They continued to stay pretty normal for the next couple weeks, and then I met a guy named Chris. I was out with some friends one night and met him through some mutual friends we shared. 
We took quite a liking to one another almost as soon as we met. We just seemed to click. So we continued to talk to each other every day after that night and soon began dating. At first, since Chris and I were still just getting to know each other, I didn't tell Becky about him, but I assumed she probably knew something was going on since I was getting all dressed up so often. I ended up getting the impression she was beginning to get jealous of the situation. Every time I would be in the bathroom getting ready to go out and see Chris, she would always try to stop me from going out. The first couple times, she just begged me to hang out with her and would say she planned on making dinner for us or that she had picked out a movie for us to watch. But when those attempts of hers failed, she took things to a more drastic level. One night, after I began getting ready, Becky came and found me. She was crying pretty hard and said that she was having the worst pain she's ever felt in her chest. She asked me to bring her to the emergency room. I had the suspicion that she was fabricating the entire scenario, but I wasn't positive. I didn't want to tell her no if something was actually wrong and I felt obligated to take her. I sent Chris a text explaining what was going on and drove Becky to the ER. A few hours later, we were on our way home from the hospital. Not surprisingly, the doctors weren't able to find anything wrong with Becky, and they told her it was probably just a panic attack. So they sent her home with some medication for her anxiety and an overall clean bill of health. About a week later, I was getting ready to go see Chris to make up for canceling on him the last time we were supposed to go out. And like clockwork, Becky approached me, begging me to stay home. She told me she was depressed and was thinking about killing herself. I know that's a serious thing to hear, but I was fed up with her at this point. I knew she was full of crap and was just trying to prevent me from going out. So I ended up telling her to call her mom or a friend. I quickly finished getting ready and left to go meet Chris. As soon as I pulled out of the driveway, my phone already started ringing. And of course, it was Becky. She called several times in a row, and I ignored all of her calls. About a minute after my phone finally stopped ringing, I received a text message, and of course, it was Becky, telling me she was going to overdose on the pills the doctor gave her. Right after I received that text, she sent me a picture message too. It ended up being a picture of a bunch of pills lying on the table with the pill bottle sitting next to them. I wanted to just completely ignore her, but then I thought of a better idea. I sent her a text message back saying, I'm calling 911. Immediately, a barrage of messages started popping up on my phone. She told me she wasn't actually going to take the pills and that she changed her mind. She was pleading with me not to call and even began to threaten me if I did. At this point, I turned my phone off and went to meet Chris. I didn't want Becky to ruin my night any more than she already had. I stayed out as late as possible and dreaded having to go back home. I began getting resentful at this point, since I had to fear going back to my own place. When I made it home, it appeared as if Becky had already gone to bed. I quietly got ready for bed and went to sleep. In the morning, Becky was in the living room and came to talk to me when I went into the kitchen. She apologized for her behavior the night before and told me she has just been going through a lot lately and has been extremely lonely and depressed. She told me she was setting up an appointment to go see a counselor and promised me she would never act like that again. I hesitantly accepted her apology, as a part of me really did feel bad for her. Things really did seem to get better at first. The next week went by completely smooth, and there was no weird behavior from her. I finally felt comfortable enough to invite Chris over to hang out and introduce him to Becky. The night Chris came over, I got stuck at work a little bit later than I had expected. Chris sent me a text message letting me know he had arrived at my house. I told him I'd be there in 10 minutes and he could just go inside and wait for me. As it turns out, when he went inside, he ended up meeting Becky at that point. I got home from work and said hi to both of them. Becky immediately pulled me aside and asked if she could talk to me. She ended up telling me that her and my friend Chris really hit it off and that she was going to see if he wanted to hang out. She even told me that he made it clear that he wanted to be her boyfriend. I stood there for a moment just completely shocked and finally ended up telling her that Chris and I had been dating for a couple weeks at that point. I knew that she must have already known that, but I still felt the need to tell her directly. She responded by saying, oh, and quickly walked away and went into her room. I went and sat next to Chris and began talking quietly to him. I told him about what Becky had just said and asked him what they had talked about before I got home. He gave me a look of disgust and began laughing. 
He said that they barely even spoke with one another, and he spent almost the entire time on his phone so he could avoid the awkward silence. I already knew that Becky was lying, but still felt the need to tell Chris about what she had said. We both brushed it off as Becky just being a bit psycho like normal. Chris and I had a nice time together that night, but things soon got worse. When I saw Becky the next day, I said good morning to her, and she said nothing back. I stood there for a moment, waiting for her to say something, but instead, she just stormed down the hallway, nearly running into me as she passed by. I went to work later that day. While I was there, I received a text message from Becky saying, You think it's funny to steal my man? You're gonna pay, bitch. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this, and had absolutely no idea how to respond to it. When I got home from work later that night, I slowly and carefully walked into the house and made my way to my bedroom. When I got to my room, I saw that Becky had left something for me on my bed. Unfortunately, it wasn't some type of nice thing for an apology. Instead, it was a doll that had fuck you written in marker on its forehead with a knife stuck through its chest. I was really mad, but also quite scared. It turns out that Becky is way more of a psycho than I previously thought. I called Chris and told him about it and asked him what I should do. He had no idea and suggested I come spend the night with him and hopefully Becky will cool off a bit by the next day. I liked his plan and quickly packed a bag and was out the door. When I got home the next day, I was hoping Becky would be apologetic if I ran into her. To my relief, she wasn't home when I got there, but my sense of relief was cut short when I walked into my bedroom. Spray painted on every wall of my room was the word whore over and over again. At this point, she had gone too far and actually vandalized property of mine. Even before this incident, I wanted her to move out, but I really had been trying to give her the benefit of the doubt and assume she would come to her senses. I'll admit, I was also somewhat nervous as to what her response would be if I did ask her to leave, but I had no choice now and decided to call the police department to make a report. A couple officers showed up a short time later and made a report. I let them into Becky's room, where they found a can of black spray paint which matched the colors on the wall. Even though it was pretty obvious she had done it, they didn't really have any proof. They told me just because she happened to have paint in her room didn't prove that she was the one that put it on my walls, but they were able to help me get the eviction process started. Luckily, the place was still just in my name so the police and I got in touch with my landlord and got a 72 hour eviction notice started. I sent Becky a text message simply letting her know that she could no longer live with me and had 72 hours to leave the premises. I made plans with Chris to stay at his place the next few days so that I didn't have to run into Becky again. After returning home, I was relieved to see that Becky and her belongings were gone. More of my things were vandalized, which wasn't surprising. I figured she would do something like that, but took that risk because it was better than being near her face to face. The next day after I returned home and Becky was gone, I started getting text messages. The messages would say things like, you're a bitch, you're a slut, you're an ugly whore, etc, etc. The weird thing was, every time I got one of these texts, it would be from a random number. I would promptly block the number only to be sent a different text from a different number. This went on for two days straight. Eventually, the text messages went from insulting to threatening. They started saying to watch my back or to not go to sleep because I would end up being stabbed that night and all sorts of other things. At that point, I went back to the police. I had saved every text on my phone and had messages from a total of 127 different phone numbers. Originally, the officer I spoke to thought that maybe someone, presumably Becky, had enlisted help from people online to send all these mean messages to me. The only problem with that theory is that all of the numbers were local to my area. Becky didn't seem to have any friends, let alone 127 of them. The police looked into the matter further and investigated the phone numbers that had sent actual threats to me. They found a common theme with each and every one of those numbers. They were all VOIP numbers, which turned out to stand for Voice Over Internet Protocol. This basically comes down to meaning that all of these numbers came from an app you can download on your phone to make phone calls or send text messages over the internet. Not only that, but you can continue switching your phone number over and over again. 
so it became pretty apparent that Becky was the person that sent every single message. I asked the police what my options were, and they told me I could either continue blocking the numbers until Becky finally gave up, or I could change my phone number. Aside from that, there was really no way they could prove who was sending the messages. I decided to wait her out and kept blocking the phone numbers until she got bored, but after a few more days of reading threats and vile things being said about me, I gave in and changed my phone number. Finally, the messages stopped. I was very careful with who I gave my new number to, and let as few people as possible have it. For the next few days, I began to feel like I had my life back. There was finally no harassment and everything was quiet, but that ended one night after work. I had just gotten out of the shower and was getting ready to go to bed. Only minutes after lying down, I was beginning to feel relaxed, but was jolted out of my semi-sleep state by the sound of glass being shattered. As soon as I was able to fully come to my senses, I thought my home was being broken into. I continued to hear glass shattering and grab my phone. I shut and locked my bedroom door as I called 911. I explained what was going on to the operator as the noise continued. They told me they were dispatching an officer and asked me to stay on the phone with them. Once the noise stopped, I sat as still as possible, trying to listen for anyone coming. That's when I heard noise coming from outside and heard a car door shut. I crawled over to my window and peeked out from the blinds and could clearly see Becky in her car as she drove off. I relayed that information to the operator. Several minutes later, a police officer showed up. We walked around the outside of the house as I told him what happened and told him who did it. All of the windows on the lower level of my home had been smashed in by something. I assured the officer I saw who did it, but unfortunately, I didn't know where they could find her. After they took my report, I gave them all the info I had on Becky, including her phone number. They were able to make contact with her the next day, and she told them she was asleep at the time of the incident. At this point, she was back living with her parents, and her mom told the police that Becky did not leave that night. I'm not sure if Becky snuck out that night, or her mom lied to the police, but I am positive it was her. I went through the process of getting a temporary protection order against Becky, and a magistrate granted it. Becky did not show up to court to object to this order. My landlord had the windows repaired, and we came to the agreement that I would pay an additional $50 per month of rent until the cost of his homeowner's insurance deductible was paid back to him. Things were somewhat peaceful the next couple of weeks, but I was always on edge. I was paranoid everywhere I went, and this ordeal was taking a toll on my mental health. The last straw happened a few weeks after the windows were smashed. After I got ready for work, I went out to my car to head in. I found that all four of my tires had been slashed, and a note had been left on my car. It was one of those creepy notes that were made by someone cutting out letters and words from a magazine and gluing them to a piece of paper. The note said, I'm going to kill you soon, bitch with a smiley face taped below the words. I again called the police and reported this. They tried to find fingerprints on the note and on and around my tires, but came up with nothing. At this point, I was forced to break my lease with my landlord and moved in with Chris after he invited me to come live with him. For the most part, things have gotten better, but every so often, I get a threatening text message. At some point, Becky must have gotten my phone number. The last time I received a threatening text was only a few days ago. Every time this happens, I report it to the police so it's documented, but they've never been able to trace any of the phone numbers back to Becky, and she literally has gotten away with everything she has done. I'm not fully sure what she is capable of, but I've been living in fear the last two years. Time will go by, and just as soon as I'm finally beginning to feel comfortable, I will receive a message saying my time is almost up or some other type of threat. I'm still praying that eventually she will go away for good and that nothing serious happens again. But I know one thing, no matter what, I will never move in with a stranger again. And to this day, I have never used Craigslist again for any type of purpose.